Okay, good afternoon everybody. My name is Maishawi and uh, I'm going to take you through a retail spotlight. So uh, to start with, the retail uh, market is ever-changing and in order to navigate our way within the retail market, we have um, to uh, navigate efficiently and effectively as much as possible. To uh, set your expectations, what we'll take you through today is uh, a glimpse about the retail market trends in Egypt and uh, its impact on uh, companies and consumers. So to start with the retail market trends, a bit about the economy. Well, we're almost uh, closing five years post uh, the 2011 revolution. And uh, since then, the economy has witnessed a lot of changes during that time. So if we look at uh, the economic rate growth, we've seen dips and increases. And uh, actually, we're expecting that it would reach an approximate 5% by 2016. On the other side, uh, the inflation is moving at a much faster rate. So by 2016, we're expecting a 12% inflation, which uh, poses as, um, you know, putting pressure on uh, consumers and on different companies within retail. Despite that, what we can see is that the fast-moving consumer goods market has kept growing despite the challenges. So versus last year, it has grown by 15%, and we can see that this growth is mainly within the groceries or traditional trade, and uh, the growth in sales is uh, moving as well in supermarkets and hypermarkets. So if we look at the growth rates, it's 9% in uh, modern trade, or what we call the big uh, supermarkets, hypermarkets, and it's 15% in the groceries. And within uh, the basket of fast-moving consumer goods, we can see that the fastest-growing sector is dairies. And this is mainly due to a lot of reasons. So we can see that there has been an increase in consumer prices over the past year. We can see that cheaper brands have evolved. And we can see that there has been new launches as well. Okay, if we... Um, talk again about the inflation that has taken place, we can see that there has been a lot of pressure on different households. And despite uh, that, we can see that groceries kept growing across in terms of number of, of stores available in the market. And we can see that modern trade has grown as well. However, the fastest growth has been in the traditional trade part. Now, We've seen the, the landscape overall and a glimpse on it. What we're going to take you through now is the companies or manufacturers and the reaction as to that. So manufacturers, given the inflation and the economic situation, were forced to either increase their prices to consumers or to downsize their products. And actually, both has taken place in the market. So we've seen that versus last year, there has been a 4% increase in consumer prices. And at the same time, we've seen a lot of brands even getting downsized multiple times throughout the year to, uh, you know, for the sake of uh, providing the same uh, brand to, to the consumer with a convenient price that the consumer can buy. Also, we've seen a lot of... Uh, companies joining together and uh, other companies or new companies in order to, to penetrate the Egyptian market, uh, acquiring or having joint ventures with other local companies in Egypt. Now, um, this is mainly in order to grow their, their business. So the, the, the latest actually we've seen is that Al Alayan, which is a Saudi company, has acquired Rashid Mizan, which is a big local uh, company here. We've seen Kellogg's acquiring two companies. Uh, first, it started with the local big uh, Bisco Mosra, and then it acquired Timmy's. And uh, we've seen uh, Pepsi and uh, the Saudi company, Al Marai, uh, acquiring uh, Beatty, and Juhaina having a joint venture with uh, Arla. Manufacturers or companies have also been looking uh, for innovations and different types of innovations in order to uh, grow uh, other opportunities uh, with consumers to buy the brands. Uh, this has not been necessarily uh, based on the fact that they would introduce a completely new brand, but uh, there has been uh, different ways taking place in the Egyptian market. We've seen new variants, we've seen 
um, new packs, and we've seen new products altogether. So some of the examples, uh, for example, we've uh, seen uh, that the pomegranate flavor has been in fashion in the Egyptian market. So last year we see that uh, Lamar has started with 100% pure juice, and then we've seen a lot of other companies following the same trend and introducing a pomegranate flavor. So Schweppes has introduced the flavor, we've seen that Beatty has launched the flavor, and even a malt drink by Fairuz uh, launching the same flavor. Other um, innovations that have taken place for new variants are like the Cadbury Marvel Marvelous Creations. We've seen new packs uh, for Heinz. We've seen multiple flavors in the same uh, brand for Molto, for example, a croissant brand. Well, consumers have well received all of these innovations, but at the same time, we can see that consumers are seeking B brands and private label due to uh, the competitive offers um, that these uh, can provide them with to manage their budget constraints. So actually, more than half of the consumers are buying private label because it's less expensive and uh, because it offers a value for money equivalent to other products that they buy at the same price. Also, more than half of... Yeah, sorry. Private label are like uh, if you go to Carrefour, for example, and you find a Carrefour brand. Okay, so these are the private labels, usually present in uh, modern trade or big uh, chains, and uh, they have uh, the brand name of uh, the chain itself. Yeah. So, um, talking about uh, promotions, which are really important uh, to all consumers, uh, more than half of the shoppers are actively seeking uh, promotions on the shelf and a lot of them are very much willing to buy uh, the promotion that is there or to even switch to other brands or products that they know about, which is, uh, which is offering uh, a promotion. At the same time, in terms of price consciousness, this has been increasing over the time. So uh, we can see that uh, versus last year, 89% of the shoppers are becoming more, more price conscious. So they know exactly what the price is for every brand that they purchase, and whether that price has been subject to any uh, increase over the year. They even notice the downsizings that take place. And uh, actually, what uh, consumers do uh, in order to fight the price increases that is taking place in the market is that some of them would cut down on luxuries, others uh, would go and buy bulk uh, products that have uh, a lower price, Others would switch to another substitute that offers a similar quality with a lower price. Um, and uh, they might switch to cheaper brands as well. In terms of uh, online shopping, actually uh, digital media has been growing massively in Egypt. And uh, a lot of uh, consumers have internet access, of course, on mobile phones or on uh, computers. And um, this has been increasing uh, massively. Uh, however, in terms of uh, shopping for uh, fast-moving consumer goods, this is still quite limited uh, in terms of uh, online shopping. However, the tendency of consumers to accept the fact uh, to buy online is increasing, and the willingness is increasing as well. So around one-third of the consumers are willing to shop uh, online for groceries, and they're even open to the idea of having a virtual supermarket uh, online that has imaginary shelves where they can pick up the products that they uh, would want to purchase. However, uh, the limitation here is that usually they would go to uh, personal care or beauty products and uh, would not go for any food items. So they would go to personal care or beauty products and uh, definitely uh, fashion or clothing or uh, even furniture to buy uh, online or to get the best offers online. So uh, the main uh, things, the main three takeouts that I would want uh, to leave you with today uh, are that if you want to launch a new brand or product, you have to be a value for money product from the perspective of the consumer. So you have to understand your consumer pretty well, know what value is to the consumer and try to provide um, you know, the optimum offering to the consumer. 
you have to be smart with your promotion. So uh, consumers are really very smart on uh, what is put on promotions. They understand uh, which one is the best for them. So not any type of promo that you can see in the market fits with any product. It depends on understanding quite well the portfolio of the consumer you're targeting and the best um, promotion type that would fit to that consumer. And you have to be available definitely in the right places. So if you are uh, not online and you want to approach the consumer, um, distribution is a key factor. You have to know where the consumer is and the place, the right place that you can um, you should be available at and can reach the consumer with. That's it for today. Thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, please go ahead. So uh, we're now going to discuss a bit more in depth uh, online versus offline. And with that, I'd like to welcome Maria Sanchez, the co-founder of Slicker, the fashion social network. Uh, just to give you a brief background about her, she's, uh, she studied, um, she has a master's, actually, <laughs> I'm sorry, she has a master's in uh, Middle Eastern studies, and she has a lot of different sets of skills, which I can vouch for, definitely, <laughs> and she also has many years of experience in PR, and Temer al Mosri, uh, co-founder and president of Joubadou, we can sit, uh, he is the international affairs specialist, by training, and somebody can come closer. Yeah. <laughs> and he's also a musician and an illustrator. And the reason uh, they started Jubeddu back in 2007 is to actually uh, give youthful talents the, the chance to express themselves and uh, to, to reach the consumer in more creative ways. So let's start off with the questions. We know there are like lots of different. Uh, points of views when it comes to online versus offline, but there's definitely common factors or key factors where when it comes to the user experience in terms of how you can uh, give them a unique experience online or offline. So I'm going to start with Maria. What, right. are the, uh, what are these key factors? Hi, everyone. Um, so before, uh, maybe around five, ten years ago, uh, we could differentiate between offline and offline. It is a completely different experience, but this is a changing trend, definitely. I think what consumers are looking for right now is a seamless experience. So they want to be able to buy both offline and online. They have to take um, into account like something which I, I refer to as a 360 experience, right? Um, basically, the user or the consumer wants to feel that he's being taken care of and that he is intelligent. So he always tries to feel that he gets the best value for money, that uh, he's getting the best treatment, a personalized experience, um, and that he is unique. So uh, whether it is online and offline, I think these are the main factors that consumers are looking for, basically. Okay, and Tamir, you guys, uh, as Juba do, you used to have lots of stores in Amman, and then all of a sudden we saw you guys online. So, which brings me to my next question. Uh, how has the growth in e-commerce actually affected traditional retail? Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, um, give a so. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd like to just, say, just situate us into this whole story. We started in 2007 in a Friday market, a stall very similar to the booths that we have here at uh, Rise Up. And from the start, our brand was a very personal brand. We like to interact with people quite a bit. Uh, the last thing we sell is the actual product. Uh, what we do is we produce the works of illustrators and designers on uh, T-shirts, hoodies, posters, postcards, keychains, and we distribute uh, across the region. Uh, when we opened the store, it was super natural for us as an extension for, uh, for, for the booths that we had. It was, an, it was a place where pe people can come and hang out, have fun, and you don't need to just come and buy a t-shirt. In 2008, we started developing our online store, first online store. It was launched in 2011, and it failed miserably. <laughs> we got 72 orders in the first year. It was, uh, it was miserable. So I redid the online store, and it also failed <laughs> miserably. And then I did it again, and it failed. 
Um, so I tried three times, and we were not able to go beyond 150 orders per year. Um, in, in April, I decided something different, that I won't do it. I actually got a team to do it, someone who knows what they're doing, because my experience is in offline retail. Give me a store, I know how to turn it, I, I can add the energy to it. And online, I was not able to translate that. It's a totally different set of factors. Um, in October, our online sales was 25% of our sales with the new team. And every day, we are getting around uh, five to 10 orders now, and per month is around 250 orders. Okay. Which is pretty cool for the new team. That's great, definitely. But what did you guys do differently? <laughs> um, what did was, they do differently? Yeah, first thing is I wasn't on that team. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and um, that helped quite a bit because I was looking at things not from a user's perspective online that I don't know anything about. I was looking at it as I want to just translate what we have on offline. But as uh, Maria said, it's a 360, which are, is omni, omni retail. Um, and that's where we failed and that's where we succeeded is where we're able to find a new experience that caters to the individuals exactly as uh, Maria said. Okay. So uh, through my personal experience in the fashion industry, the past few years we've seen a lot of online stores that support young designers, yet unfortunately none of them actually made it. They didn't succeed. However, with the growth of amount of designers here in the region, someone has to do it differently. So we it hope that someone is slicker. So can you tell us a bit more how you intend to use that growth in your sure. own benefit? So a brief introduction, uh, Slicker is a social shopping platform for fashion. Uh, what we do is we merge a social network with e-commerce, uh, making the shopping experience engaging. So you basically avoid the typical flat, com common experience of going to the e-commerce and just picking and, and buying. We make it much more engaging, interactive through users and brands. So um, I think there's Two things. First of all, uh, fashion industry in Egypt is uh, relatively new. Um, E-commerce is very new. So when you mix both, then you there you there you have the the failure, right? So it's still very immature. E-commerce um, it's it's a concept that has been introduced in Europe and in the States not so long ago. So for Egypt, this too might have been too disruptive five years ago. Another thing, another point is like uh, Slicker, what we offer, it's a complete, it's a free uh, space for brands and, and, uh, and designers to have their store. So we don't take any commissions for their sales and we don't take any money. We monetize through premium stores, through data and through advertising. Therefore, these brands and these designers feel much more compelled to come online and have their stuff there. Because... Uh, any other e-commerce website would take 30, up to 30% from their sales. And new designers, they cannot, they, they, they cannot pay that, that much. So this is why we are very different for brands and designers in this, in this sense. Definitely. So can you tell us a bit more how you guys plan on including innovative ideas within uh, Slicker to, to push sales even further? Yeah, so basically... Um, what we discovered is that we had a, a cool platform. It, was, it is beautiful, but it's not that engaging. And what it has to be, it's completely engaging. So people can come again and again and have returning users and increase sales. So what we are, uh, we are launching our app, hopefully in, within a couple of months, and this app will have much more, uh, it's, I cannot really reveal it, but super cool features for people to, um, to create their own outfits, uh, to share it with your friends, uh, connected with all social networks, and so on. So for brands as well, it's a great platform to increase their sales. So you, can, you have to always, always keep on like, adding new features that, that maximize or that give the most benefits for, for both sides, users, consumers, and brands. Okay. And Tamer, how do you think uh, traditional retail, when it was faced with new, new technological aspects, how can you keep on pushing in terms of that aspect? Um, for the first two years, people were using the online store as a catalog. So they used to go online and they 
uh, check out all the designs that we, for example, we have, but they come and shop from the stores. But it, it used to look like our bounce rate is high from the website and our conversion rate is low, but be, it was only because we could not measure the conversion that was happening inside the stores. So this is why you have to have a full, full experience. If you're not present physically in a store, in a, in a country, and you have an online presence, if you have a high bounce rate, you need to find a way to, to, to capture it in the stores. Okay. And uh, if they find something online, they need to have the same experience when they come to the stores. Um, one way we were able to retain customers is we introduced a global uh, point system. So it's a global loyalty program. If you buy from any of the stores and then you travel and you want to buy online, you still have access to your loyalty card, uh, and which helped us retain people who travel a lot. And it actually helped us promote the website even more. And these are some of the kinks that the, the, the new team was, was adding to the, to the feature. To the I wanted to add to what Tamer was saying. And you mentioned before the omni-channel. Yes. Like, I, I was reading that uh, right now, 60% of uh, the sales, or 60% uh, of, of what you buy, you do it through an omni-channel mm, kind of technique, whatever, which means that you use more than one way. So you go to your phone, you check the whatever is uh, discounted, you go to your laptop, you check where the store is, and then you go to the store. Yeah. So the three or four channels that you're using have to be optimized, uh, because if one of them fails, then the, the shopping so. experience is completely cut. Yeah, that's so, true. so this is a challenge that now uh, retailers are facing. They have to have a proper uh, stock um, that is uh, online and offline, and it has to be the same one. Because if not, the experience is like, you know, it's, it keeps on like blocking, 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 blocking. So it's the only talent experience. Yeah. It's a chain reaction. People, yeah. and, you know, most advertisers, marketeers try to tap into users on 10 different points throughout, like, let's say, on your, uh, just like uh, Maria said, in your phone, uh, on a billboard, that's yeah. also part of the experience. It, it, and even though we have digital marketing, it did not kill traditional marketing. Whether it's in uh, creative content creation or a billboard, it's those touch points that really end up having the customer to come and buy, whether they convert either in your store or online or at a, a distribution channel. Like if they go to Virgin and they buy a Job Edu t-shirt, they might have seen that uh, online. online. Yeah. yeah, it has to transition smoothly between all platforms, exactly. that, definitely. So you spoke about different channels and mobile is currently key. Yeah. I mean, from our side, we have like 70% of our yeah. traffic coming through mobile. So I want to know a bit more, how do you guys deal with that in terms of giving users a cool mobile experience for yeah. shopping? So in, uh, in our case, as far as Sleeker, um, right now we are web-based. That means that we didn't have a, and we don't have still an app until, uh, you know, I told you like hopefully in, uh, within two months. Okay. But since the very beginning, we made sure that the the experience on the phone it's cool enough. It's super important. Like um, over 60% of users come from mobile, and you ha and even more and more. So at a certain point, the desktop experience will literally disappear. So you have to be mobile. You have to uh, focus on having the coolest app, on having the best experience on mobile. And, and I think we, anyone who's working on online uh, knows that. So you kind of have to forget a bit about the desktop and move towards mobile. Yeah. That's it. It's definitely much more important yeah. at the moment. Uh, so the question is to Temer. Uh, you guys, as I mentioned, have the, offline, have the offline and the online experience. So how are they different in comparison when it comes to uh, retaining the, the user or the customer here and there? It's the offline store, when the customer enters, you already have a human contact. You can laugh with them, you smile, you, you joke around, and you, you interact. Some, and a lot of the times, they build a personal relation with the person selling them. This is, even though we have the chat service on our website, and our staff is really fun to chat with, and if you talk to them, you can talk to them about anything. Yeah, um, that's but true. It, I actually, and when I go to your stores when I'm in Amen, they're very fun. We get to do lots of fun activities so there. This is what I'm working on now, is how to, how to translate this experience and bring it online. Uh, we're, we're also working on an app. Uh, we, we've just started to, to test the grounds with Jobedu Radio. Because mm -hmm. I think an app 
needs to do a lot more than sell because if the last thing I do is sell my product in the stores, it has to be the same thing online, which is very difficult for me right now because it's, a, it's an online store. You come and you shop. Uh, that's why Jobedu Radio is there to, to, uh, to introduce um, uh, al the alternative music scene to a wider, wider audience. Um, we work, we, we, in our stores, we do not play mainstream music or uh, the, the top 50 or anything from the West. We play stuff from this region yeah. because the odds of Autostrad or uh, Salalem entering the store and listening to their music is much higher than, much let's higher. say, uh, Van Buren or whatever his name is. <laughs> so we, th this cu culture we're trying to bring to the online store as well. And did you guys manage to do yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, but on the desktop, you have Jobedu Radio, but we want it to be a main feature in the app. Content needs to be a major part of it because people are not just going to come download your app and buy stuff. They, they want to do a lot more with it. So, yeah, definitely. It has to be a much more engaging experience yes, for them and to yes, feel yes. the, the Jobedu essence online as well to, yeah, to come back more often. I think there's two messages. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a message that you have to have a mobile app but there's something that people are not really thinking about is as users, how many apps are you willing to have on your phone that are not relevant? And even if Gap and H&M and everybody wants to do an app, doesn't mean everybody's going to download them. They need to offer something a lot more than just selling because that's why your website's there. You need to uh, give a value added to the, an extension because the mobile is an extension of the person uh, using it. And they're using it to make their lifestyle to, to amplify their lifestyle in a certain way. So your app needs to be relevant to your user's lifestyle, yeah. not just a, a, a shopping cart. That's true. Uh, okay, uh, I wanna uh, ask Maya to come back uh, with us, please. Because if you guys have any questions, we'd love to take them now. Sure. Hi, Maya. Yeah. yeah. Mini? <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, I have time just to, to, to ask a couple of them and maybe after uh, sure. the session, uh, I'll yeah, contact definitely. you for them. The first thing, uh, so, since when you have launched it? Is that a question? Uh, in Egypt, uh, we launched around eight months ago. Uh, okay, generally, I'm talking about the business itself, uh, Slicker. Since yeah. when you have launched it? And everywhere. I mean, the, the, the first. Uh, worldwide. Yeah, worldwide, yeah. Worldwide, worldwide, seven worldwide. months ago. Seven months ago. Yeah, so, seven, eight uh, months ago. The question is actually. Uh, do you think that seven months away from, from launch uh, till launching the, the mobile apps yeah. is, uh, is, is logic? I don't know. This is a really important is question. It lo is it logic? Yeah, yeah, is it logic? Because today you know how much people to rely on mobile to reach. Uh, Definitely, to, so, but you have so why to not, why not you have launched it since when you, ha you have launched it maybe a month or a couple of months after it? Uh, uh, I will tell you why. Uh, mobile? It's a, an app, it's a completely different thing from a website, yep. right? Uh, I will tell you a bit, the trip, like very fast, the trip. The, f the very basic idea was to disrupt fashion, okay? We didn't know how. We had a slight knowledge on how to do it, but we didn't know how to start. So, uh, okay, let's start working on building community, all right? Let's, uh, I have a, my co-founder, Mo, his... An amazing designer. He created a website. He designed it. Uh, he designed the coolest uh, website, and we started creating a community from that. From then, we started building the team. We were two, and we started building our dev team of developers uh, that were uh, back end and front end, but never app app developers. It's really hard to find a very good app developer in Egypt. Yeah, that's very true. hard. So we've been struggling, like honestly, uh, in order to find someone who can offer us the best product because we cannot have a me mediocre or a no so no uh, product, but uh, you have to have the top. And in order to do that, we need to research who can offer us that. And this is why we actually, we haven't launched an app until now, yeah. okay. if that answers your question. Okay, uh, this, uh, the second question. But no, 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 we've no, been eight no. years on no app, so she's doing a really good job. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're fine. Okay. The second question, actually, about uh, your hub. Yeah. Um, you, you target customer. As I understand uh, you, if I understand you well, it's B2B and B2C. B2B, yeah. uh, when you talk about the, the, the yeah. stores and the B2C, the end customers. Mm -hmm. So B2B segment, what customer you are targeting? B2B? Yeah, the B2B. So 
Yeah. Is it brands only, big brands and well-known No, names? not at all. Like or just everybody, maybe, maybe me, for example, if I want to open a store at your platform, can I, can I have that? Yes, definitely, you can. As long as you, have, you follow our guidelines, you can definitely open a store on, on our website. Okay, yes. the last one here. Because I know Top. that I got a lot of time. So if you follow certain uh, guidelines that uh, as any other uh, platform, yes. Okay. So how do you reach your customers? B two B. B two B. It's really you know in it's in in Egypt has been quite easy because many stores they don't have an online presence, and they are hungry to be to be there to have an online uh, space where they can sell. So they at the beginning we were it was us, uh, me personally who was approaching the brands. So we found the brands actually contacted us. Uh, and until today, we, uh, we were able uh, to gather almost 100 brands on the platform. Uh, we have over 7,000 registered users, registered, uh, registered uh, users, uh, and around, yes? No, no, 80 B2B, 80, the, oh, from 80 to 90 brands. Uh, and because we have to as, as actually to filter them down if they don't follow the guidelines and so on. So we have to make sure that this is the same level. And 7,000 B2C. Let's say. As in you, subscribe as users. Visitors. Subscribe. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, OK. I'm sorry. We're going to have to take a question um, over there. Thank you very much. Uh, I think like in terms of sort of online retail and, and commerce generally, I think one of the challenges I've seen, I'm, I'm Jordanian, but I live here in Cairo. I've been living here for the last couple of years, so I'm familiar with, with both markets. I think it's just basically how you pay is really key. Like, I think there are many, many online stores, but they only like, you know, they only have like basically payment at delivery, like in cash. And I think mo the movement towards online payment is very important. Like the only the only place in Cairo at which I was successful to pay online was El Cinema, but all the rest like I buy from Nature's Gift, like other sort of grocery shops, they only accept payment in cash at delivery. I think this is key to basically the growth of online commerce and retail generally is to really be able to accept um, uh, credit and accept mo mo online payment quite massively because that's the only way for this sector to grow. Uh, Oh, okay, I'm not sure that's a question or it's a comment, but you do you have Okay, like, so are now you open we are working. Like, yes, how do you yeah. work both both you guys Joe video and uh, yeah uh, So I think it's you have uh, you, You've made a very very good point. It's true uh, Right now how all most most of us we are working on cash on delivery including us We don't manage any stock and we don't manage any delivery So the brands are the ones responsible for delivering the stuff and getting the payment uh, but we are uh, integrating online payment uh, as soon as we launch the app because it, this is basic. Although in Egypt the market is still not really aware of online payment, it will be uh, eventually and it's going to happen fast. And because ours is a global product, we have to have it. So we are definitely including that. And many stores, I believe, uh, from food to uh, to fashion retailer, whatever, they are going to be doing the same. It's, it's, it's moving towards online payment, yes. Uh, but I want to add, okay, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. La, yeah, we accept first. everything, <laughs> <laughs> any method of payment. La, but I want to add to that uh, because I've heard the people from uh, suit.com speak before and they were talking and Noah, online shopping, it doesn't make sense still in the Middle East just to, off to offer like uh, credit cards or PayPal and stuff like that. It, because the consumer is more used to uh, paying cash on delivery. But on the other hand, that's also a problem because they'd go to deliver the item and people are like, no, we, want, we don't want it anymore. But that's where we need to find the balance because we need to offer that online in terms of online purchasing only. But if you only offer that option, you might lose out on a lot of other clients who would yeah. prefer to pay uh, cash. But yeah. in the States... Yeah, yeah, I know my, my brother shops, he, he goes on Amazon, he buys every sunglasses there are for Nike. He gets like eight or nine pairs, they get them delivered, he chooses one and then he gives back the rest. Yeah, but it, but so they don't have cash on delivery, they have credit card, but uh, it's, it's not just uh, the cash on delivery, it's also the logistics part. Yeah. Well, that's true, it's a mix yeah. of different things, but it's mainly because the market might not be ready yet or they're not yes. fully yeah, tech yeah, yeah. savvy to understand the, the, yeah. how it should that's work. Yeah. Yeah. So next question. 
Uh, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, and then we're going to take the question. Okay, I have a comment and a question. I'm Abdul Adir. Uh, regarding the online payment, I, I would like just to add that since the, the market, the whole market is not mature enough, like what you said in the States or yeah. even in Jordan, I bet, uh, that the banks themselves they do not offer the easy and flexible uh, payment gateways for, for, for websites to use. And also for the part with the logistics and the buy and return and all the deliveries, it's all, it's all still new to everyone. So, so this is a big problem. So I would like to ask you what, uh, there, I saw some samples or models of people reserving or, or booking their items online and picking up from the stores. Have you tried using any of these models? We personally haven't, no. We That's haven't done the idea. online booking, but it's a, it's it's a pretty a good, good idea. idea. Yeah. Definitely add it to the mix. Yeah. <laughs> Thank okay, you. I'm sorry. We have to take a question from this side because he's been raising his hand for quite some time. And then, hello, my name is uh, Karim. I have a question for Tamer. Alan um, Tamer. How, how do you uh, make sure that the artists get to know your company and start sending you their designs? And then, how do you work commercially with them? Do you, do you share the revenues, or how does it work? We have uh, multiple models. We, when we first started, we used to pay just cash to the, to the designer. We headhunted a lot of the designers at first um, on uh, Behance, on DeviantArt, and a lot of these channels uh, where we can check out their portfolios and we have a uh, dialogue with them until we build the repertoire. Um, but as the brand grew, we now have a dedicated place for them to submit designs at. Um, now we are introdu yeah, we've introduced a revenue share model with them. And we're developing that model even further to make it more fair for the designer. My company's uh, main goal is to maximize creative payout. So we're here to create a revenue stream for the artist. So anything we can do to maximize their payout through wider distribution, higher margins, lower costs, that's why we're here. And do, and do they come to you by now or do you have events to go and get them from where they are? They, a lot of designers come to us, but we still we haven't stopped the tradition of going out to seek the designers. Perfect. Question here. Hi, a question to Maria and Tamar. Where do you see the trend f for the next couple of years in the Middle East? Where do you see other countries uh, in this exact sector? Is it just specific to Egypt or across the GCC? Where do you see the new innovation coming out? Where do you see the whole sector moving? Do you see brick and mortar designers, uh, old established coming online to serve the Middle East? Or do you see this rise for new players? Okay, um, I think Egypt right now uh, is the fashion industry and fashion tech is gonna flour flourish very fast. Still, it needs a lot of education for all sides, whether they are designers, online platforms, like ours, uh, even, uh, it's gonna happen here. Uh, this is a huge market. You have to, again, take into consideration that Egypt is a country with 90 million people. So it has much more potential, although other countries like GCC have the money, let's say, here you've got the potential, you have the community, you have uh, the mm, people, uh, you have more minds. Uh, you could see how, as well, Lebanon, it's, it's a country where fashion and fashion tech is growing very fast. So I could, say, I could say that Egypt and Lebanon right now are the, the most promising players, while GCC and, and the Arab, the Gulf, let's say, would be consumer, mainly consumers, but not uh, creators or creatives. Um, what I think is like Egypt, uh, in the coming five years, we will, we will see a huge shift and a huge change and probably we will see all these designers that are now here going abroad and seeing how this local scene will be expanding internationally and and i'm sure we will see that but still it's too early uh, same for all other arab countries but probably egypt and lebanon are, are the ones who have in my opinion the, the biggest potential right now um i think we're building a lot of bubbles I, every country is going to be a bubble of its own and it's just going to keep on expanding as a bubble but it won't actually burst until we revolutionize the whole mobility of goods and people in the Arab world. And you um, think that's going to happen? It, I think as consumers it will drive it because um, 
getting goods in and out is the biggest challenge, even if you have Aramex, if you have DHL. Yeah. This problem we're talking about of exchange is there because um, of the banking system that is not integrated across the region to, and money will take around 45 to three months for it to come back. So nobody goes through the hassle of offering it because it's going to kill your cash flow. Yeah. Um, all of these will, will end when you have better mobility when we can actually ship goods without having to worry about whether it will reach a customer or not. Yeah. So the trend is, I think we're going to be getting a lot of these big bubbles like Egypt and then <laughs> KSA. But the bigger picture is going to be the bursting of all these bubbles when it's really easy. You're going to have a, a, a train rail go through all these countries and uh, goods will be able to be delivered much easier. Okay, can we take a question over here? Hello. Yeah, so this is a question for you, Tamir. So uh, when you were trying to like transition from retail to online, why didn't you try using Instagram, for instance? And what do you guys, what can you guys add to that lean approach that people have been taking uh, when they're getting into fashion, when they're just going to, hey, I'm just going to use Instagram, I'm just going to sell uh, everything, cash on delivery, or maybe get like a POS, POS machine? Um, did you ever think of doing something any of that sort? And uh, for you, Maria, is that making any like impact on something like Slicker? Is it like kind of competing with you guys, or what do you guys think about that? You want me to start? Uh, all right, so yeah, very quickly. Um, channels such as Instagram um, or Facebook, they see there is a huge opportunity uh, in online shopping. And we didn't see before uh, anything. Uh, Instagram, is, it was not a, a channel for shopping. But they are moving towards that. So, yeah, I hope Instagram becomes my competitor uh, at any moment in time. So, yes, definitely, they are a huge platforms that many, like, especially on a local level, plenty of Egyptian designers, and I think in other Arab countries as well, they are using it to commercialize and to sell. So, it's, it is a competitor, yes, yeah. Now, when we first started to go venture into the online, um, Instagram was not that big. I don't know how. Uh, Ashraf, when did Instagram start? <laughs> 2012? 13? Yeah. yeah, we started in 2008. That's one of my problems. If I start a little too early and um, I fail, which is great. But I kept on failing over and over again until now Instagram is a huge part of our online marketing. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's an integral, integral channel just as Facebook and uh, um, our newsletter, the, the message is uniform throughout and it's just another outlet to get another sale. But it does not uh, substitute my online uh, platform. And actually with the Instagram, I've heard a lot of designers giving us feedback in that regards that the kind of clients that order there are they're the ones who are willing to pay more, they're the ones who are more fashion savvy, they understand yeah. Yeah. It's completely different than the, the, mark, the, the users who are on Facebook, exactly. Yes. So, yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. But Instagram is a very good way to, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, yeah. platforms like Jubedu, to drive more yes. sales for it, for example. That's what I mean. So, can we take any more questions? Well, are we out of time? You guys tell us. Last. And I can't see. <laughs> Last question, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, hi. So this is the question for uh, Jubadu. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with all the buyouts and right stuff? Because, you know, uh, dealing with some designer, uh, actually they have to move from a kind of personal artistic approach to a business one. So sometimes you have some pretty ideas. Oh, let's take the Walt Disney design and let's uh, put it in Arabic. Yeah. But you can do that, of course. Or you you cannot do it when you have when you are in countries where where like uh, you know you have rights and buyouts and everything. So because I can see you have a superb uh, sweater uh, with uh, you know that uh, randizer stuff. Yes. So how do you deal with this kind of stuff? I mean, is it something that is uh, a a brief for you? Uh, you know, I'm saying that because you, you, we uh, we already talked. We also have a, a brand. Yes. in uh, Tunisia, and uh, this is something we, we are totally like, uh, uh, aware, of, aware of, and we refuse all kind of ideas that are from this side of the Mediterranean very okay, you know, we don't care about the buyouts, but when you think about going abroad and taking your designs abroad, 
then it's an issue. So, uh, how, so how do you see it? There's a fair use for fan art. Um, if you use the design as is from, a, from an IP, it's, it is the problem. But if I understand your question correctly, is how do we protect the artists? No. The, uh. How do you make sure that the design you then sell on your, I mean, I mean, on your website or on your boutiques, on your stores, you can do it because actually you have right to do it. Because normally you, you are not allowed to use some, uh, like... Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, exactly, uh, about the yes. copyright. If, yeah. if you use the design as is, is the biggest problem. For example, when we wanted to do a Labiba t-shirt, it's Alu Labiba, we bought the rights for Labiba from Nippon Animation. Uh, when we did the, the, the Thor t-shirt and I did uh, Audited Jedha, Jed, uh, Star Wars, I went and I met with Disney to talk to them about licensed fan art. And uh, they were perfectly cool. For it. If it's not the character as is, it's, um, it's where you get into complications. Uh, but uh, uh, no, if it's the character as is, you get into complications. But fan art like uh, is is very, uh, it's fair use. Even Threadless has that. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, it was the last question. I'm sorry. You have to like approach them first. Thank you, guys, so much for your time. And that's it.